and we're live. Thank, thank for, for the uh, technology to go into the world. I experienced it last week from coming back from Virginia. I saw Nancy was sitting. Nancy was sitting down. She kind of reminds me of Charles Stanley sitting down at a desk, but she teaches. But uh, it's good to be able to pick that up and follow along. I'm thankful for those, and hope everyone had a blessed Merry Christmas. And I think it was Adrian Rogers said one time in one of his devotions, he says, "The day after Christmas is one of the more discouraging days for some people." And you're, you know, get caught up in it. That when he said, "The lights don't bright, the lights don't shine as bright, and the packages don't look as bright." On well, the day after it is, you know. It's kind of like taking a vacation for Christmas, after Christmas, going to see like the Rockefeller Center and stuff. I don't think I want to see it after it. It's something, something in your head, it's just not as good. But anyway, Adrian went on to say that, you know, the material things of the world fade, but certainly knowing God's involved and what Christmas is all about keeps is as important before Christmas as after Christmas. But certainly, we're thankful to be here. Thankful for those who filled in for us who were on the road sometimes as we're Continuing, and I thought about doing a um, Christmas lesson today, but I'll leave that to the pastor to teach today as he does the Sunday service. But we're continuing on in the study of the seven churches of Revelation. Today we come to a, probably a lesser known church, but a name that will come up in it that everyone knows. This is the church at Thyatira. I reckon I'm pronouncing that right. As this is the last section of chapter two. This is... Uh, I believe it's lesson seven of those, or six, whoever writing along, but I'll let Terry take care of that. It comes from Revelation 2, 18 through 29, and we'll read that after we open with a prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for giving us this season, this uh, Christmas season. Actually, good weather compared to last year when it was stormy and blowing. Certainly, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, to study your word, to celebrate the birth of your son who came as a child to live for us and ultimately die for us. We ask that everything we say in Sunday school and church today would glorify you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we said this is, Terry, is it the seventh lesson or the sixth? I can't remember. <laughs> but this is the third, the fourth church. As we've come to the church at Ephesus, and then we've been to Smyrna, and then we've been to Pergamon, and now we're at Thyatira. So said we go back, we're in a semicircle. Uh, we were probably close to the top if you were looking at it geographically uh, as we begin this study. Let me read. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works." But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my words until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule with a rod of iron. As when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's certainly the Word of God for the people of God. Sir, may God bless the reading and exposition of His Word. If you notice, that was the longest of the letters that we said. These letters went out to all seven churches. As we were, John got the, the vision on the island of Patmos, and these were given to seven churches. And so this was the longest of all the churches that uh, was given. In all the churches that we've seen up to this far, far there have been this kind of similar pattern. Uh, there were some generally commendable qualities and then that was kind of marred by carelessness uh, and things that needed to be taken care of. And uh, sometimes it outweighed the positive. The positive is usually outweighed the negative. Except for the church at Smyrna, there was nothing bad said because they were being uh, persecuted for their faith. 
Well, the church at Thyatira that we just read really was a hardworking church. And Jesus commends them for working hard, for loving faithfully, loyal in their service and the great faith and patience they had, but they had a problem there. A chink in the spiritual armor per se that caught Jesus' attention to this church who we know from the first chapter was the head of the church who held the seven churches in his hands and certainly continues to do it today. As I said, these lessons that he wrote were not only to those seven churches, but the church to the ages and the individuals in every church today. Well, how about the destination of the letter? I love the history of this commentary that tells us where all the churches were at. Well, unlike most of the other churches that Jesus addressed, Thyatira was not known for its grandeur like the other ones that we've talked about. It didn't have a big cultural center, learning center like uh, Pergamus did, had a library and all that. It was known more for being a working class commerce area. Unlike, I think it was Pergamus or Smyrna, one of them that was built on the top of a hill, this was located in a valley between two cities on one of the busiest trade routes through the Asia Minor area. It boasted, I kind of think this would be a city like maybe Cleveland or Pittsburgh that boasted of thir um, steel workers and labor unions and guilds. In this city, we know history tells us there was a, a baker's union, bronze worker union, clothiers, cobblers, weavers, tanners, dyers, potters, and other workers. So it was kind of a working class city that we're here. And they were hooked up in these unions. Uh, we don't know as much back down in the south, but if you lived in the city to the north, you know they have trade I mean, unions that look out for the workers. And certainly it was to promote trade and protect the workers. So it seems that Thyatira was the least important if we talked about it in all of the seven cities in the, in the region. But it receives the longest of the letters from the Lord. Now, he begins, as he always did, diagnosing the church with pictures of that vision we had from chapter 1, which is why I said many moons ago when we started it, pay attention to the vision of himself. Now, he begins this one saying that this designation to the church, we said was probably to the uh, pastor there, he designates himself as the Son of God. Now, he introduces himself in that because we're going to be introduced to a lady who's at this church that really has a name that I've never heard anybody call today. It goes by the name of Jezebel. Now, how many of you think about it? You ever met anybody that had a name Jezebel? The only one I can think of was a little house in the prairie that time when Mary, <laughs> you all laugh, when Mary went to teach and they called her a Jezebel, but that was not a positive name. But So Jezebel did to the name Jezebel, what <coughs> Judas did to the name Judas. You know, you, you ever heard anybody called Judas? No. Not even many people called Jezebel. Well, she was considered in Scripture here as this prophetess of God, and now Jesus, as he addresses the church, he calls himself the Son of God, which is going to stand in judgment on this important prophetess who's located in this church. And so Jesus wants to make sure I'm right into you as the, from the authority of the Son of God. Now he also designates himself as the all-seeing God. And remember when we looked at the vision, one of the things that John turned and saw was Jesus standing there with his eyes in the flame of fire. They are designated to this church. And the point of those was that nothing could stand before the fire of his eyes. It would come into contact. It could see through all the different things that were going on at the church. And that the eyes of fire that the Lord has was seeing everything that was going. There was nothing that was kept from those piercing eyes as he pierces into this church. Now, the idea that God can see all things, if we think back, is seen throughout all the scripture. Well, we can go back all the way back to Genesis chapter 16, where there was a young lady, I guess she's probably a young lady, who was left out in the wilderness because her myth. Her friend didn't want her around anymore. Remember the story of Sarai and Hagar that uh, Abraham couldn't and Sarai couldn't have any children. Abraham and Sarai, I mean, my terminology right, couldn't have any children, so he took matters into his own hands and had his children with Hagar. And then when the baby was born, Sarai didn't like her, and they run her out and turned her loose in the wilderness. And when she thought she was going to die, she remembered seeing the eyes of the Lord could see her in the wilderness and protected her with the angel. And, the, and her son Ishmael, Ishmael. So we go back that as far back as the sea and the all, sea and eyes of God. And Jeremiah, 
And Jeremiah 11 tells us that the eyes of God test the heart and mind of all men. And certainly the apostles and the Acts would know all this. And of course, John tells us that Jesus knew what was in all men quite often from our study of that. So knowing what was happening in Thyatira was an important thing as the eyes of fire were seeing what was going on through the facade that maybe the others couldn't see. But the one other thing that we get from that vision, remember he was standing there with the hair of white and the eyes of fire, but his feet were like fine brass. We see that coming in the designation of this church. As he says, he begins to see the feet of brass that are looking there. We said that brass was an indication of judgment that was getting ready to fall. We go back to Deuteronomy and God was to tell Israel that the sins they had when they sin, the heavens which are over your head shall be brass, meaning their prayers were one unanswered because of the judgment that was falling on the people. So it's important to this church to realize that the Lord was standing ready to judge them with the piercing eyes for what was going on there. This is the same happens in churches today and in people today who are trying to hide things from the Lord. Those piercing eyes sees and looks to the hearts of people. It was John Sice in his commentary who was talking about that. He says, Is there anything more piercing than flaming fire? Everything yields and melts before it. It penetrates all things, consumes every opposition, sweeps down all obstructions, and presses its way with invincible power. All of this sort are like the eyes of Jesus. They look through everything. They pierce through all the masks and the coverings, search the remote recesses, and behold the most hidden things of the soul where there is no escape. So Jesus said, just to them, to us, to everybody today, I can see what's going on. We can't hide anything. Was it David would say, if I went to the bottom of the sea, to the highest heavens, everywhere in between, where do I go from the presence of the Lord? So we get the impression something was not going on right if he's looking with eyes and he's got feet of bronze. And then he comes to the diagnosis. And there's really, he says a lot of good things about this church. First of all, he said they were a laboring church. Now, first of all, he mentions their work, which was really in the Greek a general sense for all of the good things that were going on. I had the pressure they were maybe looking out for the widows and the orphans, and they were doing helping people that were in need and all those things. But then later on, he uses a word for service, which means they were not only doing good things, but were involved in ministry. It's the same word from which we get, well, this our church don't do it, but this, previous church I grew up in that had things in it called deacons. I think we have what we call elders in the Methodist church and probably Presbyterian, but the Baptists have deacons in it. And that means the word for service. Of course, we go back to Acts. Remember when Stephen was one of the first deacons and Philip and all those guys. But the function of the job, what was going on, they were doing kindness to all things, doing service, ministering in the church, ministering to people. So this church was very... Kind of reminds you going back to Ephesus. They were a very involved church doing lots of things for the people in the community and the church. Here's where we get a little bit of a difference between this church and Ephesus. Jesus describes this church as a loving church. Even with what we're getting ready to see, some significant moral things going on, they were a church who was filled with love. As Paul would later say in 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest of all the virtues is love and this church certainly had that it's interesting to note i love this in the commentary to recall that the church at ephesus wouldn't tolerate false teachers and false prophets and all that but what was their problem they had left their first love this church was tolerating some things that shouldn't be in the church but guess what it was a very loving church so you know the commentary went into detail there's some people and some churches that are strong in doctrine but aren't very loving. You know, being a people that, oh, we follow the Bible, we do X, Y, and Z, but they wouldn't walk across the street and give you water if you were in need. You know, unfortunately, Christians might like interact with And then there are some that are the most loving people in the world that are just doctrinally completely missed the road. Jesus is pointing out to all the churches and people of all the weaknesses and strengths of the church and to it. He goes on to talk about how loyal they were. So they were loving and serving and loyal. And he expressed how the Greek word pistis, I think so, I pronounced it right. I didn't take Greek in college, so I didn't do that. It means where they were, they had faithfulness, fidelity, and loyal. 
They were dependable, reliable. These were the kind of people that if you needed something, they would come and say, hey, now Terry's in need over there. And everybody would get a little care package and make sure she got it. And she was loyal to the members and loyal to the faith. Here's one they had that uh, is something they always say don't pray for. They were patient and long-suffering. <laughs> uh, patience was next on Jesus' list to them. Um, they had the ability to continue to be loving and sticking to everything in the midst of storm being storm tossed and under pressure uh, because they had the trade guild and all that was going there. That was really putting some pressure on the church to conform to the ways of the world. But these guys were certainly not giving up. Really, a lot like the church at Smyrna, holding on in the midst of it. And then one of the things that really you don't pick up on if you as you read it, he says they were a maturing church. The fifth character is, is kind of less specific, but you have to pick it up. When he says that there are things that they did at the beginning, that later were better than the things they did at first. They were growing in maturity and coming closer to being in what we call, if I can use one of the sanctification words that Paul Harris used to throw out, remember? Uh, so they were growing in the faith, getting better and more and becoming more like the Lord in which we're supposed to do. So very commendable. So far, so good, right? However, just like, you know, if we were sitting in here and freaking says, y'all yeah, did this and do that, but, remember the English papers? Grammar was good and syntax and everything, but yeah, hold on just a second. Rodney, your penmanship is horrible. I can't read it. Yeah. <laughs> Heard that more than I still hear it from the office when the girl, I write something and give it to the girl, like, can you come read this? I don't know what that is. I saw Jane Crosswell in the bank the other day and we were talking, I can't hand a deposit slip to the clerk. She says, how am I supposed to read that? Jamie says, Jamie says they tell me the same thing. I said, I guess doctors and lawyers can't run. <laughs> you know, they give you that, take it over there. What is that? <laughs> but, he says, well, I've had this against you. You allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit immorality and things offered idols. So in the midst of this beautiful, I love this, I'm just going to read it. There was a weed in the garden at Thyatira. There was a cancer in the body. And it was this woman Jezebel, who's an epitome of Jezebel. She was introducing immorality into the church. Now, the original Jezebel had been dead for a couple thousand years probably by the time this happened. But there was apparently a woman in this church who was promoting the same kind of licentious and immoral lifestyle who Jezebel epitomized. Now, last week, I guess two weeks ago, we went back to the Old Testament and talked about Balaam. Remember that? We had to go back to Numbers. We're going to go back into... I can't remember what book she was in. Oh, King, First Kings. And talk. let me explain to you who Jezebel is. It's kind of, we were joking earlier that, you know, Jezebel... You don't see anybody named that way. You don't, that beautiful little girl that's been born. We're going to call her Jezebel. Okay. Here's why. She was the wife of one of the more wicked kings of Israel at the time by the name of Ahab. You remember, my aunt used to call me Ahab to Arab because I was always into stuff. Now, her father was a priest of Ashtaroth, which was the Phoenician equivalent for you. Uh, Greek and Roman historians of Aphrodite and Venus. So, you know, you were talking about the goddess of love and sensuality. Now, under that idea of religion, religion was divorced from morality and sexuality and immorality was introduced as part of the religion, which pretty much meant that prostitutes, both male and female, were considered priests and priestesses in the religion at the time. So, that's sort of what she was grown up in and what she was talking to good old Ahab and bringing into the his Jewish religion. Now Ahab should have never married her. I mean, we knew she was a bad seed from the beginning, but he did what he did. And when she brought all this into it, she actually persuaded him to build a temple to Asherah in Samaria. That comes from 1 Kings 16. And supported, you remember how many prophets she had? 850 that set up this immoral cult. And then she began systematically killing off all of the prophets of Israel except for one guy. Anybody remember who it was? Start with the E. Elijah. 
Because remember, they had the little the battle up on the mount and called down fire and all that good stuff. So she must have been a fearsome woman. <coughs> Obviously, talk Ahab and all that. But after a Elijah had that big battle on Mount Carmel, where remember they set up the bull on one side and the bull on the other, and they were dancing and cutting, and whoever fire came from heaven was going to win the battle, and who's going to be the big king, and all that. After that battle, with Elijah won the battle and all, had all this, he runs away from a woman. He ran from her for his life was this, as we would say, was a scared. So she was the epitome in the Old Testament of corruption immorality and idolatry. As I said, she'd been dead for years, but apparently in this particular church there was some woman who was promoting the same kind of lifestyle and claiming to be a prophetess leading uh, to immorality and to the church and all those things that were going on. So this is what was going on in the midst of this church and it was being allowed to happen. Now it's amazing to see that how the, each of these has deteriorated. Ephesus would not tolerate any false teaching in them. Nothing at all. Smyrna certainly wouldn't have because they were being persecuted for it. Pergamus was allowing some things to happen. They really weren't allowing, uh, they were tolerating, they weren't actually letting it go in full blood. But Thyatira was literally allowing it to happen in the midst of the church. You know, like today. Yes. Allowing, you know, so certainly, well, you know, it begins with we'll allow it to happen and then no, it's going to blatant it, glare, we, don't, we know it's there, we're not going to do anything about it. That's sort of what was going on in Thyatira. So total rejection in Ephesus had now become a toleration and had just really outright uh, allowance going on in this church. And Jesus has got to say it's a serious problem. Now John Stott in his commentary says, you notice, if the devil can't conquer the church by political pressure like at Smyrna and persecution, or heresy, sort of what was going on in excuse me, Pergamon, he will try instituting evil into the church to destroy the beauty of the church. That was the devil's strategy here in Thyatira was allowing this evil to happen in the church. Well, the Lord has several messages, and I didn't realize it. I don't know how many times we studied it, but several different messages that he writes. First of all, he has a message to those who were followers of good old Jesse here. He says, to you that are involved in the Jezebelian cult, as he's told all three of the churches before, repent. But apparently they or she or her followers had not done so. And he says, there's a terrible judgment that's going to happen upon you. You would be cast into a bed of affliction. Uh, most of the commentators think some kind of physical sickness, some kind of physical thing that was going to come upon them. So not only her, but all of those who were her followers if they didn't repent and get rid of it. And Dr. Jeremiah in the commentary says, I wonder if the old adage that we say today quite often, you've made your own bed, now sleep in it. And then we say that all, all the time. I wonder if that maybe had found its origin, origin back as far as the church here by a tower would be a good research for somebody to do something. Anyway, uh, the judgment was coming and going to be leveled against her in the cult. Not only would she suffer, that those who would follow her and their children and their children's children would be killed. So this is serious statement coming from the Lord of what he thinks about allowing immorality in the church then and today. And all of this judgment we take takes place by knowing those eyes of fire and grass who's looking at what's going on. So that's a serious, serious message to that church of what was going on. Now he has a message to those people because there was also people in this church that were true to the word. There were followers. There were all those commentaries. And he has a message to those. And Dr. Jeremiah said, you know, it's almost like a breath of fresh air to people today that are living the right life. They come to the church. They study the word. They're not tolerating. They're not allowing it and all this stuff. He says, I don't put any other burden. I don't impose. Any. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're not following the evil. You're not following Jesse. You're not doing all Just serve God and keep doing what you're doing. It's almost like a breath of fresh air. The Lord says, I understand what's going on, the pressure that's going on. I'm not putting any other burdens on you. Just continuing to do what you're doing. And certainly to the church today, just keep doing what you're doing. Finally, there's that message that we've seen in all of the churches is to the church, those what we call the overcomers, those who hold out to the end. And he gives them two promises. 
First, he said, if you will stay faithful to me, you will be given the right to rule one day. Now, that's certainly a reference to the millennial kingdom that happens after the rapture and the Lord returns and sets up his kingdom on earth where it's told that the saints will reign on high and the lion lays down with the lamb and all the tribes and all the believers through the ages will have places to do in the new kingdom given the work that the Lord calls them to do. So they're going to be given a place of prominence in the kingdom. Second, something that's a little bit more obscure, but after you research it, you're like, hey, it makes a lot of sense, is the promise that we're references all the time where Paul says the next event that happens, the rapture of the church. Here is a promise of that. He says, to the end, he gives the promise of the morning star, which seems to be the reference to the Lord himself, but what did Jesus is calling himself? He's the bright and morning star. Now, the morning star is the light that comes right before the daybreak comes, who will come before the darkest hour, and then the Lord comes after that. Sort of reference that, hey, I'm going to give you myself and take you with me so you won't go through the enduring darkness of what is coming after the rapture and all the bad things would happen on the earth that we read about over in the rest of the book of Revelation. <laughs> so the Lord is making a promise to repent to the cult and the bad things that are going, repent, turn away from it, get away from it, or else you will suffer. Kind of weird that the church at Ephesus, remember, we were told if they didn't repent, they would lose their uh, influence, they would lose their light. To this church, he says, you might lose your life. And of course, I remember one time when we were studying the, the communion table in the Last Supper that Paul said, make sure your heart's right when you go up there, or you could suffer some things even up to taking their life. So Jesus says, repent and get away from it, or else you may lose many of the blessings you have, and to those who are holding on, keep holding on. So, the message to this church, repent. If you're caught up in this immorality and all this is going on, get out of it. If not, it, the judgment's going to fall. But to those of you, pay attention, keep on holding on because you have the promise of me, the promise of the future. And I love how he always says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the church, the Spirit says to the churches. One last thing. In your do you know that I always like these things. We're going back to good old Jezebel. If you know, if you're an old history buff, you know this. She um, suffered an ignominious death, if you think about it, for those that remember what happened to her. Uh, there was a judgment that was pronounced upon a good old Jezzy by good Elijah again, that because she was sinned and didn't repent, that she would die a horrible death. First king said that she would be eaten by dogs in the city of Jezreel. Well, several years later, since she never did and was threatening Elijah, there was a righteous king by the name of King Jehu who came to the city of Jezreel. And Jezebel was up in the uh, what do you call it? capital. The palace. palace. I couldn't get it out of my mouth. Too many dark not do it. And when the righteous king came in and called to her, she wouldn't come and she was thrown out of the window to the streets and crashed on the ground and died. When they, Jehu later gave orders for the soldiers to bury her body, there was nothing that could be found by her except for three things. This is kind of nasty. Her skull, her feet, and the palms of her hands according to 2 Kings 9. So that was the confirmation of what was happening to her because she didn't repent in the evil that she bought, which really kind of goes to the grossness of what hey, may happen to what would happen in Thyatira if they didn't repent and turn from the way. Next week, we begin a new year, we will turn the chapter to chapter 3 and see the, see the fifth church, which is the church at Sardis. You'll learn that this is probably not a nice church to be a member, and... Uh, I forget where I was traveling one time and I saw a sign that said Sardis Baptist Church next right. And you understand that if you know what was going on in the church of Sardis, you may not want to be a member of that church. It would not be the nicest thing for us to say the Sardis Church, Methodist Church in Williston or something. It's not a nice thing to say. Well, we'll close with a prayer. Father, we thank you once again for letting us read and understand a little bit of what you had to the churches. And as we said... Um, 
may we examine ourselves as a church and individuals to find ourselves as maybe not caught up in too, too much work but losing the first love and emphasis or allowing compromises like a parliament or just outright an immorality at Thyatira. And Jesus' answer to all was to repent and change and that those who overcome will be given the ultimate blessings of the future. May we all examine ourselves as individuals in church and realize that this is the way that you examine us and tell us to live. And may we live as we go into the new year with the understanding that you want us to live and that you hold us in the palm of your hands as individuals and churches. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And if